Interlude, At the Mouth of Hell, Tiboka City, Camino, Come With Me, 99 waved at all cadets he managed to gather after the evacuation order came in. He glanced behind the his younger brothers. The far end of the corridor was mostly blocked by a barricade made of whatever the oldest cadets could get their hands on. Those boys had chosen to stay behind and buy the rest of them as much time as they could. 99 was proud of them. Sounds of blaster fire and explosions had been creeping closer and closer in the last ten minutes. All reports coming over the calms were grim, there was no stopping the Jedi working for the Separatists. All the clones could do was slow them down and if very lucky, extract a pound of flesh in return. As if that wasn't bad enough, Order 66 came in almost an hour ago. Every clone knew what that meant, the Jedi had betrayed them all in when they were needed most. 99 shook his head and began running towards the landing pads, those were still secured, he hoped. For his brother's sake, not his, 99 didn't intend to leave his home. He knew that the fleet couldn't possibly take everyone with them and he wasn't going to take the place of one of his whole brothers, much less than a seat which could hold one of the kids. Rapid fire erupted from behind and 99 redoubled his efforts. Go, go. He waved again. The older cadets couldn't possibly succeed where the trained soldiers failed. Fortunately, they didn't need to. They just had to buy a bit of time. 99 and his charges got out straight into the raging storm when a loud explosion shook their barracks building. The cadets had no explosives and were likely dead now. I'll hold them off. 99 shouted. Go. That way. He pointed in the direction of the pads. They weren't particularly far yet he couldn't see them through the sheets of rain falling from the skies. 99 waited for all the cadets to go past him then took cover behind the wall next to the door. A content smile appeared on his face. While he hated the clankers and traitors who successfully attacked his home, he was oddly grateful too. They gave him the chance to go out like a real soldier, just like the rest of his brothers. 99 glanced down the corridor and saw a pair of flimsy B-1 droids move through the smoke. He took careful aim and gently pressed the trigger just like his favorite brothers taught him so long ago. His first shot flew through and the closer clanker flew apart. 99 grinned and shot the other machine too. Two minutes later, when a commander droid finally took down the crippled clone, the cadets were already on an assault shuttle boosting for the heavens. Among them was a youth calling himself Boba. They were the last flight to make it off Kamino before the orbital bombardment struck. Equals Arch hey equals. Republic assault ship Tarsis. High orbit over Camino. Move it people, Rex shouted. He and the few remaining survivors of the 501st were in the hangar busying themselves by helping with the evacuation. There were a lot of wounded to move to either the overworked med base for the critical cases, a nearby first aid station, or the back of the cavernous hold for those who didn't look like they would make it. There weren't a lot of the latter. Most of the mortally wounded were left behind, something that made Rex's blood boil. Camino was their home. They were born and raised there. Those are the last transports. Prepare to clear the deck, someone shouted. Lots and assault shuttles came in at speeds that were anything but safe. One of the small gunships couldn't properly break and skid across the deck. It was a pure miracle that it barely missed the dying clones before it slammed into the far wall. What are those maniacs thinking? Rex exclaimed. The anger in his heart suddenly died and he was thinking clearly again. Get on that lot and make sure it won't burn. Medic 2. The commander ordered briskly. Move it people. Something made him look at the open end of the hangar where his home could clearly be seen. Rex frowned when he felt a pang of regret immediately followed by anticipation. It was then when he knew what was about to happen. Rex could swear that he could sense the gunnery officers across the fleet give targeting orders, could almost see gunners aiming their weapons. There was something wrong. He knew this wasn't merely orbital support. The whole thing felt wrong. Rex's eyes widened when he saw the first salvo. There were hundreds of turbolaser bolts raining upon Camino. Before his mind could properly register what he saw, Rex knew what was happening. He could somehow sense it in the back of his head. Whatever this madness was, it was happening all over Camino. Then the bombardment struck. Rex lacked words to describe what he experienced. It was death itself that manifested in the hangar bay. He was screaming, just a single damned soul among so many. He felt them, his brothers abandoned to burn on the surface. Clone masters dying by their millions as well. 
They were all screaming in pain and anguish. They were dying and a part of Rex went with them. The second barrage hit and somehow the death became more intense, even more real. Rex knew he was dead and this had to be the nastiest Karelian hell. The next salvo went in. Rex was wrong. After all things apparently could get even worse. The commander could feel his own mind unravel. So much pain, it should have knocked him off. It should have killed him. But of course the torture was without end. He was in hell. Death stripped Rex to his very core. It washed everything else away with the notion of blood and when it was about to consume his very soul, something shifted. The agony was still the same, that of billion dying souls. The madness was clawing at his mind and Rex knew he was already over the edge, when he felt a familiar presence. At least he would be in good company. Rex felt a gentle embrace. He laughed, shrieked and cried when his general dragged him back over the edge of madness. The onslaught continued, yet Rex was no longer alone. Vale was beside him, using his own body to shield the clone from the worst of the onslaught. The general was the spark of reason which kept him from sliding back into madness. When Rex's home howled accusations as it was murdered, when it condemned the sons who failed it, Vale was there to convince him he wasn't a wretched failure of a man. When Rex believed he was one of the monsters responsible for torching Camino, his general was there to tell him it wasn't his fault, that he could still look himself in the mirror. The general was the only light in a sea of never-ending darkness. He was the only thing standing between Rex and the abyss. Vale didn't need to ask for anything. He was Rex's unmovable pillar of strength and he gleefully bound his very soul to it. An, this part of the update was inspired by Uriel on the Space Battle Forums. Thank you very much. Equals RK equals. Cis Shuttle 988 to 56 liters. High orbit over Camino. Get us away faster. Jedi Knight Dini Strum shouted at the droid pilot. We need to get everyone off planet, she continued to frantically plead at the Solar's machine. This is TK-51. Explain yourself, Jedi. A tactical droid's image appeared on the right side of the cockpit and an angry mechanical voice snapped like a whip. The Republic is about to bombard Camino, Dini I spat. You need to get everyone out now. She trailed off. It's too late. This wasn't the first time Dini I felt a world die. Not even the first time it happened in this era. Yet even before the first shot hit the surface, she already knew things were going to be different this time. The Force was going wild. It literally shrieked its warning for the whole galaxy to hear. Dini I blanched when she felt so many people die. Their dying cries merged into one with the screams of the Force itself and the Jedi joined them. This was so much worse than anything she had experienced before. There were no words in any language to give voice to the agony Dini I felt when the Force itself was torn asunder. She howled as wave upon wave of pure darkness spilled from the abomination that used to be Kamino. That corrupting darkness drenched the very essence that made Dini I stern the woman she was. It drowned her. It murdered her. It made the pain go away. It embraced her into a sheath of welcoming darkness as it washed all of her concerns away. Jedi Knight Dini I Strum was no more. She was something less, yet more. She was home and free. Dini I opened her eyes and awoke to an endless sea made of welcoming darkness. It was as much a part of her as she was a part of it. This was the dark side. She was magnificent, more beautiful and powerful than Dini I could have ever imagined. The former Jedi frowned. There was something wrong nearby. She could see the breach which let the dark side pour all over Camino. How could she not, when it was the whole planet? Yet, there was another breach nearby. It was so similar yet different. It was drinking from the dark side like it was a fountain sprinkling crystal water. Dini I looked at the anomaly and frowned. She knew it, know him. It was Vale, the man who murdered her master. The dark side was with him and Dini I was torn between fascination and boundless fury. Equals Arche equals. Flag bridge. Corellian cruiser freedom. The abyss between the stars. I let the battle meditation go only when we were three jumps out of Camino. Only a quarter of the fleet was with us, however I was hopeful. Thanks to my battle meditation, two-thirds of the fleet that was still operational when the orbital bombardment began managed to leave the system. They would be joining us soon. I made sure of it. A tired sight escaped my lips and I looked around. Everyone was looking shell-shocked and I knew they were feeling so much worse. Joanna turned to look at me. There was both hatred and devotion in her eyes. 
She slid to her knees and began to sob soundlessly and she wasn't the only one. At least half the people in the compartment were in the same state and most of the rest could simply stare in empty space. They were all broken and it would take time to heal. I went to the Admiral and sat down on the deck next to her. Why? Joanna asked and turned her tear-stained face away from me. Shh. I brought her into one-handed embrace. For a moment Joanna shook with revulsion, before she relaxed and her head fell upon my shoulder. Why did you did this to us? She asked in a tone fit for a lost little girl, which right now wasn't far from the truth. Because I need you all. I told her the truth. That simple admission sent a spike of pride and warm fuzzy comfort through her heart. She loved it and loathed it in the same time. You broke us. And I will put you back together. In your own image? Anger and longing were so thick in her tone that it was painful to listen. Yes. Thank you, Joanna said. I was sure she also damned me in her mind. A small part of me loathed what I did, what I was still doing. The rest, I was ready to pat myself on my back for a job well done. Then there was the smugness coming from the dark side. I had my fleet. I had my people who were closer to me than anyone but my two dead wives could ever hope to be. I finally had an army on which I could count on no matter what and for the first time since arriving in this mad future I felt completely safe. A.N. Well. This covers the Kamino Arkansas now I'll be dealing with the other consequences of the Jedi coup and after that I intend to begin RK's sequel which will cover the rest of the Clone Wars and their explosive conclusion. Epilogue. Equals RK equals. Part 1. Nightfall. Jedi Temple. Coruscant. I'm sorry. Sarah Kito sighed. Can we talk about this? She tried. They were so close. Most Jedi in the temple were already out. Why did she volunteer to go back and make sure the archivists scout out with the most important holocrons? The two livid clone fire teams pointing blasters her way answered that question nicely. The Jedi Knight knew her words would fall upon deaf ears, yet she was compelled to try. Too many died already because of the Sith. This madness did little else but to feed the dark side. Crithing Sith. Keto knew it when the clones decided to act. She could see them squeezing the triggers of their weapons before their brains even gave the order. They were good. Veterans all. Unfortunately strong-minded like a most clones stationed in the temple which was quite unlike most of their ilk. It didn't really matter in the end. Sarah ignited her lightsabers and charged before the closest clone could open fire. Two shadows moved behind the troopers and soon turned into temple guardians whose armors were scorched and dented, yet that didn't slow them down. Before the clones knew what hit them, three Jedi were among them. The following fight, if one could call it anything but a slaughter, was over in seconds. Where's the archivist? Sarah asked. The closer guardian pointed down the corridor where four more of their kind appeared escorting a frail-looking old human woman. Each of them wore a large sack over their backs, hopefully the holocrons. Good. We need to leave now or we'll be stuck on Coruscant. Let's avoid that dear. The climate here is no longer healthy. The archivist smiled sadly. The younglings? Master Yaddle got them out. Then we're done here. There was the tiniest hint of regret in the old woman's voice. We need to leave now, one of the guardians said. Sarah nodded and waved them to follow. This way. Equals RK equals. When Order 66 came, it wasn't a complete surprise. The events on Coruscant earlier that day led to hundreds of Jedi dying, primary at the Jedi Temple. That shock reverberated throughout the Force. It put the Jedi across the galaxy on edge, yet, the warning was a double-edged sword. A few were wary or paranoid enough to keep close eye even on the people under their command. Others began looking for cis traps or reinforcements. Once the transmission from Coruscant spread through the galaxy, chaos reigned. Many were shocked when their own troopers leveled weapons at them and demanded surrender under the charge of treason. For some Jedi the shock was sufficient that they complied. A lot of them even lived long enough to be taken to secure locations, though for a significant number the disruption of command in the middle of battle spelled disasters. They fell either to cis units which were fast see an opportunity and exploit it or shot up by clones when they tried to defend themselves and their actions were perceived as an attempt to escape in the chaos. Only three Jedi who were forced to fight against the Sith after their arrest were lucky enough not to be gunned down by both sides. A handful even managed to escape and got to be at least temporarily free. 
equals RK equals Sector 11. Undren. Jedi Master Ajala Secura felt almost at home in the jungles of Undren. Walking through shadows cast by tall trees, smelling the scents of the vegetation. It was soothing, something she sorely needed. After Sakura began sensing Jedi dying earlier that day, she put her forces on high alert. When no attack came in the first couple of hours, her patience ran out. Ajala still sensed Jedi dying though it wasn't nothing in comparison with the first hammer blow. Yet, the force was going mad. The Jedi Master could practically hear the cackling of the dark side. It shrouded everything as it grew more and more powerful by the minute. Sakura knew that things were going to get worse. The Force practically screamed that warning in her mind. She was compelled to do something, anything. That's why she went on a patrol. It wasn't like Ajala could simply leave and go to Coruscant to check what in the name of the Force was happening over there. Contact with the capital was lost and that didn't bode well. The Jedi Master couldn't help but feel like the fate of the galaxy was being decided while she was stuck on Undren. Yet, it wasn't like she or the Republic had much choice. When the Clone Wars began, Undren formally seceded with Separatist backing no less. They were neutral so far and Sib initially expected them to remain so or risk a rebellion by those who supported the Republic. However that changed when Vale revealed himself for the whole galaxy to see. Oh, it took months for people to begin believing that he might be telling the truth that he was the Sith of old he claimed to be. Once that happened, any hopes for widespread rebellion on Undren died. Even now, thousands of years after the Sith Empire ceased to exist, the locals still remembered and loathed him. Del Qatar Vale. Lord Vale. The Butcher of Undren. The planet still bore scars that could be seen from orbit from when the man came and conquered the place for the Empire. Looking at those places, Sakura could feel the echoes of the death clinging like miasma over the otherwise pristine world. As a consequence, the people willing to help the Republic when Sakura arrived with two army groups and a decent-sized fleet were few and far between. The locals fought fanatically to slow down the Gar advance. They knew that the Cis was coming and were among the few populations who would see them as liberators. Sakura understood where they were coming from. She could be sympathetic. Yet, she had to keep Hundren from the Confederacy's hands. If her forces were thrown out, the enemy would have a friendly base of operation which they could use as staging ground for deep strikes in Republic space. That had to be prevented at any cost. The Jedi Master stiffened and focused on her surroundings. There was danger in the air. She could. Stand down, General. The lieutenant behind her snapped in a tone leaving not a shred of doubt what would happen if she disobeyed. Ajala froze and very slowly turned her head so she could glance back at her men. The closest clones had formed a semicircle behind her and pointing their blasters at her back. The rest of the platoon was spreading out so they could have clear firing angles. What is the meaning of this? Sakura snapped back, though she made sure that only her lips moved. We just got orders from Coruscant. The lieutenant growled. The Jedi, the name came as a curse, just attempted a coup. Order 66 is in effect. You're under arrest for treason. You resist, you die. The most notable thing, besides the preposterous accusation was that the lieutenant didn't address Ajala by her rank. There was a long moment when Sakura felt fear. The dark side all but screamed at her that surrendering meant death. The Jedi felt cold wave passing through her and sending shivers up and down her spine. Her hand twitched and it was a miracle Ajala didn't summon her lightsaber before she could think straight again. It was true that the clones might be lying. She could sense their anger, but that was all. They didn't feel any different than when they followed a more usual order. They might just want her to disarm herself so they could take her down safely. Or they were simply trying to arrest her. Sakura knew one thing, if she fought now, there would be no turning back. This had to be some kind of mistake. The Jedi wouldn't attempt a coup, unless they felt they had no other choice and even then, I surrender. Sakura spoke clearly. On your knees. Remove your lightsaber slowly and row it our way. Any resistance will be met with lethal force. Equals Ashe equals. Unfortunately, there were a lot of places across the galaxy where things went truly wrong. Many Jedi were on edge after sensing scores of their brethren die. When their soldiers turned on them, a not insignificant number was not inclined to go down quietly. Many of them believed that they could either escape to figure what in the name of the Force was happening or that a surrender might spell their doom. On more than a hundred worlds Jedi fought and died. 
Eleven managed to get away, instantly confirming their status as traitors and earning themselves death in the eyes of the Gar. There were also places where Order 66 went wrong for everyone and none of them could compare with the disaster in the making at Corellia. Equals RK equals. Part 2, Ragnarok Act 1. Even as Order 66 made its way across the galaxy and set it on fire, there were a few notable exceptions. At one of the Republic's most prestigious military academies, Ahsoka Tano was in her room buried under a small mountain of data pads. When the Jedi coup began, she felt restless. When she felt Jedi die in impossible numbers, she was terrified. Ahsoka tried to call Obi-Wan only to find out that Coruscant was under a communications blackout. When that news made its way across the academy, the Commandant put the whole facility on lockdown just in case, while every military unit in the system went on high alert. As far as anyone but Ahsoka knew, there was no attack coming. No physical one anyway. What Ahsoka felt through the Force, she would never forget. Jedi were dying by the hundreds. First on Coruscant, later all across the galaxy. Tana felt the dark side drowning her perception and crashing over her. She heard the dying screams on a whole world. That day something intangible changed in the Force. It was like the sense of a deja vu. All Ahsoka knew for sure was that one future was close to her. To everyone. It was as if the whole galaxy paused to take a deep breath before exhaling and just continuing on its way as if a world dying didn't matter. Yet, it was on a subtly different path. There were no clones bursting to arrest her. If one wasn't able to hear the Force, they might not have figured out something was wrong, just like most of the cadets found out about the events of Coruscant hours later. When all is said and done, with the exception of the lockdown, it was just another normal day at the Academy. Well, not quite, with the Force in turmoil, Ahsoka Tano was distracted and for the first time since arriving failed to turn in her assignments on time. Her instructors were not amused. Equals RK equals. On Coruscant, the only effect that Order 66 had on Obi-Wan Kenobi when it came was that it guaranteed him even stronger protection detail to keep the Jedi from attacking him again. The same was true for his wife and the Mandalorian Embassy, which were surrounded by a strong guard presence, to keep anyone from bothering them. The Mandalorians were torn between feeling amused that the Republic military for once was willing to protect them and furious at the insinuation that they couldn't handle the Jedi by themselves. Oh, they had concerns. No one was looking forward to explaining to Mandalore that his wife was critically wounded and even after hours of surgery no one knew if she would survive her encounter with Mace Windu. On the face of it, she fell in an honorable combat against a worthy opponent. However, the Mandalorian still remembered the Sith of old. Mandalore wasn't likely to care that his wife fell in proper battle. When he came back there would be hell to pay and every Mandalorian warrior on Coruscant was looking forward to that. Equals RK equals. Flag Bridge. Republic Cruiser Gallant. Corellia. Plo Koon checked the time. Just one more hour and Yularan would be here, which was good. The Jedi Master was going to need all the help he could get. In less than four hours of all-out combat all across the system, almost half of the new construction and a large chunk of industry were gone. Two of the five brothers had their own navies overwhelmed. The orbital defenses breached and droid armies on the ground moving in to eliminate as much of the planet-bound industry as they could. A third of Kuhn's own assets were torn to shreds while he met the enemy again and again. What's worse, two of the Corellian heavy cruisers were mission-killed, they were leaving the system at Ballistic Arc with their engines cripples. One more had more than half its weapons gutted after suffering multiple suicide runs. The enemy paid a steep price for their success. The system was chock-full with the wreckage left by Holsis fleets, yet the Confederacy still had enough numbers and firepower left to take the system. After the last clash, Plo Koon began contemplating bullying back to Corellia, where a lot of his damaged ships were gathering along with almost half the surviving Corellian fleet. We're going for one more fast pass then pulling back. The Jedi Master decided. That wasn't the order he wanted to give. He knew something was terribly wrong on Coruscant. He felt many friends as well as people who were a major pain in the backside lately die over the last few hours. What the Jedi wanted was to order a retreat so he could bring his fleet back home to the Jedi Temple and face the enemy who attacked it. Instead he was stuck here. The sheer madness he was sensing through the Force didn't help either. Whatever was really happening, it was of the dark side. Plo Koon could sense its insidious power grow in bounds as Jedi after Jedi died. General, 
we're getting transmission from Coruscant. The communications officer exclaimed. Put it on. Kuhn ordered the clone. It took precious seconds to get the transmission cleared. Time the Jedi needed to give orders for his sub-formations as they would be entering effective range of the enemy in just a couple of minutes. Execute Order 66. Chancellor Palpatine's voice came over the comma moment before the man's mangled image appeared next to the tactical plot. Those words froze everyone on the bridge. Order 66 is in effect. Security to the bridge. Gallant's captain snapped. The Jedi Master looked around as the transmission from Coruscant finally got cleaned up and was played in full. General, you're under arrest for treason. Please come in quietly. The captain turned to face him. I see. Plo Koon sighed. May I ask what exactly is Order 66? What the crifted teen and Piel did? Or were the Sith to blame? In case of Jedi treason all Jedi are to be placed under arrest. If you resist your life is forfeit, General. I see. Plo Koon repeated, then frowned. What do you mean all Jedi? Not all of us are part of the military. Those on Corellia aren't currently part of the Republic much less the Jedi Order. All Jedi? The captain repeated in monotone as he was reading from a document. The Corellians are certainly included. We'll be moving to take them into custody or eliminate them ASAP. What is this madness? Plo Koon exclaimed. He didn't know if it was the strain of combat. The chaos in the Force or feeling the death of so many Jedi. Perhaps it was the utter calm with which a man he considered friend discussed an act of war against an ally of the Republic. An ally who even now fought beside them. It was an utter madness, yet the captain felt as if he was discussing the weather. The clone was utterly calm. It didn't really matter in the end. Plo Koon's composure broke. I can't allow that. The Corellians are our allies. No matter what's happening on Coruscant. The green Jedi are innocent. Kuhn's hand fell upon the hilt of his lightsaber. You chose to resist then. The Jedi felt the tiniest pang of regret coming from the captain. The armed crew members on the bridge drew their sidearms. Behind the Jedi, the armored doors were opening and he knew there were more soldiers coming for him. He had to warn the Corellians. It was his duty to stop this madness from spreading. Plo Koon drew his lightsaber and the bridge descended into chaos. The gallant didn't alter course just before engaging the enemy as the general intended to do. The cruiser's task force, which used it as a leader continued to follow it in. When contact with the flagship was lost, the rest of the task forces reacted sluggishly. What should have been a fast pass meant to concentrate firepower and minimize engagement times was anything but. When Plo Koon cut down the last clone attacking him, the gallant was shacking under the guns of more than 30 separatist ships. The Jedi Master went to the comm station and attempted to warn the Corellians, yet it was for naught. The Gallant was deep within an CIS formation and their ECM made anything but laser comm useless. The Jedi Master lowered his head and closed his eyes. He failed and all the people who he killed on the bridge died for nothing. He didn't react when more clones stormed the compartment and opened fire. It didn't matter. Before his charred body hit the deck, Gallant shattered under the guns of the Confederate ships. There were no survivors. Epilogue. Equals RK equals. Part 3, Ragnarok Act 2. Jedi Temple. Corellia. This sucks. A petite human girl grumbled. Yep. Jaber grumbled and looked up at his friend. Eli Cerulean sat a few stairs above him and looked criminally cute in her form-fitting forest green robes. Are you listening to me? The Jedi Padawan frowned at him. Jaber smiled. Eli looked even more lovely when she was getting angry. Of course I am. Aha, uh -huh. Eli sighed. Why are we stuck here again? Beats me. Jabo shrugged, which made his friend roll her eyes at him. No Padawans on the front lines if we can help it. Duh. A new voice came from above. How are you two lovebirds today? Jabo looked up and saw an older copy of Eli walking down the stairs. Mum. The young girl suddenly turned beef red. Mom. Jabo shot up. He was very glad he didn't sit closer to Eli otherwise her mother wouldn't stop needling them any time soon if the last few times were anything to go by. Seriously. How are you? With the way the Force feels. The Jedi Knight shrugged helplessly. There wasn't a Force-sensitive person on Corellia, probably in the whole galaxy, who couldn't sense that something was terribly wrong. 
For hours the Jedi Temple had been on high alert with both poor second Gar sending reinforcements on top the two battalions stationed nearby in an anticipation of possible separatist attack. As good as could be expected, I guess. Jabo frowned. Something happened to my master a few hours ago. He's been keeping his bonds shut ever since he went after Crimson but I could still feel it. He shuddered. I know he's alive but otherwise. A pair of strong yet soft hands pulled him in and Jabo found himself embraced by Eli. He relaxed and hugged her back. She felt like warmth, spice and home. Made him feel at peace even as the force went more and more chaotic. Mum, do you know what's happening? Eli muttered in Jabo's shoulder. Not for sure. There's no contact with Coruscant and the situation in orbit is less than ideal. Nejimu explained. You can feel it too, don't you? There's something in the air. Eli mumbled. The force flared. Shots and explosions erupted just outside and Jedi began to die right there on Corellia. Go back. Nejima ordered. She was already sprinting towards the main doors of the temple. There were Corsac troopers stationed across the big antechamber who were either doing the same, taking cover or shouting in their calms. The teens looked at each other. They didn't need to speak aloud and just nodded and ran after Eli's mother. When they got to the doors, both of them froze in place. Outside was a war zone. Clones and Corsac troopers were shooting at each other. The Republic soldiers were fighting the few Jedi who were outside the temple too and the teens arrived just in time to see Najima enter the fray. A Republic walker blasted Corellian hover tank. Two platoons of supposed allies tore viciously at each other and another green Jedi fell when he was shot at from three sides before his killers were either cut to pieces by Eli's mum or shot by vengeful Corellians. For a moment it looked that this was it, then laser blasts lanced down from the sky and began killing the defenders. Jabo's head snapped up to see a swarm of larts coming in fast. Far behind them ominously hovered a familiar triangular form. We need to get out of here, Jabo exclaimed. Not without mother, Eli exclaimed. She'll be with us soon. Nejima looked their way. Go. Mum, come with us. Instead of answering. The Jedi Knight turned around and raised her hands. A swarm of missiles launched by the approaching gunships froze in midair. Come. Jabo grabbed his friend's arm and began dragging her inside. No. Mum. Eli struggled to get free. Laser cannons roared. A handful of shoulder-launched missiles answered and the space in front of the Jedi Temple suddenly became a death ground. Eli and Jabo were thrown through the temple's entrance by the blast waves and left dazed on the ground. When they came back to their senses, the teenagers were being dragged up the stairs leading to the temple's upper floor. The building's antechamber was turned into a killing ground by wave after wave of clones attempting to push back fanatical Corellian resistance. A platoon of heavy troopers finally did the trick when they blasted through the walls next to the door and stormed in firing heavy weapons at anything that moved. Equals RK. Site K. Location classified. What the hells is going on? Governor General Shyla Merikope snarled. The head of the Corellian government glared at her advisors before her furious eyes fell upon her liaison with the Gar. I have no idea, ma'am. Captain Jorge Victor's answered. My best guess is that Order 66. This is the first time I heard of such a contingency. The Coruscan type born and bred officer looked mightily uncomfortable but he didn't appear to be lying, or he just was a better actor than Shyla gave him credit for. General. Place that man under arrest and get him out of here. Give me an open channel to all forces and system, ours and Republic. Merikope ordered. Shyla's eyes went back to the live feeds from Coronet City. The Gar Battalion stationed near the Jedi Temple was busy assaulting the building they were supposed to protect. All Republic formation in the region were making their way there and fighting anyone who was attempting to stop them, which wasn't going well for anyone. There was a whole army group on Corellia and the bulk of those forces were in the general vicinity of the capital. To make things worse, a number of Republic cruisers had entered the atmosphere before anyone knew something was wrong and were moving towards Coronet too. They had already sent waves of gunships and assault shuttles at the Jedi Temple which was a war zone. Dictat, all we are getting as an explanation is that Order 66 is in effect and anyone attempting to prevent its execution is to be considered traitor. An exasperated sounding colonel reported. We've got open channels to R and the Republic ships in system. This is Governor General Shyla Merikope to all Republic units in the Corellian system. 
you're to cease offensive actions against our people at once or we will respond with deadly force. You will explain yourselves now. All Karelian ships, Contingency Winter. I repeat Contingency Winter. Governor General Merrick Hope, this is Rear Admiral Felix, acting commander of all Republic forces and system. A clone in the green uniform of a flag officer appeared above the hollow tank in the center of the room. I cannot do so. Contingency Order 66 is in effect. All Jedi are to surrender into Republic custody at once. Any resistance means their lives are forfeit. The clone paused. If your forces continue to resist the execution of my lawful orders, I will be left with no choice but to consider them enemy combatants. My orders leave no latitude, ma'am. Order 66 is to be carried at any cost. A deadly hush fell around Shyla. Equals RK equals. Part 4, Ragnarok Act 3. Site K. Location classified. The diktat made a hand sign and the outgoing transmission was put on hold. I need options. Merikope's voice held barely controlled fury. Military? We might be able to hold the orbitals if the remaining Republican separatist forces and system bleed each other badly enough. We've got heavy Republic reinforcements incoming under Admiral Yularen. It's anyone's guess if he'll try to stop this madness or continue with it. The man in charge of Corsac must. On the ground, Corellia is currently secure with the obvious exception of Coronet and the surrounding regions. We've got running engagements with GAR units on eight separate locations. An assault ship over the capital with a Venator and two more approaching. An aide gave the general a data pad which he skimmed through before continuing. We've got multiple battalion level formations converging on the Republic forces with QRFs heading for the Jedi Temple. The theater shield over Coronet is being raised as we speak, however as you know it won't cover the temple. It's just outside the outer perimeter. The general side. It's possible that those ships will bombard the area if the Republic ground forces are unable to secure the Jedi Temple. I require authorization to take them out with either the anti-orbital defenses or if that's not practical I'll request the Navy to neutralize them. Political options? Shiloh asked in marginally more controlled voice. It depends what the hells is happening on Coruscant. Who or not, for all intents and purposes the Republic just began a shooting war with us. That Admiral didn't seem to care for the political fallout of his actions and I'm finding that highly disturbing. Merikope's oldest politically ally and advisor added her two credits. Besides, even if all our Jedi part of the Gar suddenly went insane and joined the Separatists or something we are still independent. The Republic has no right to simply demand that we hand them our people and attack our military personnel when they refused as they should have done. Shyla finished. Even if she and her government were willing to just hang the Green Jedi on the Republic said so, that simply became impossible when the Gar on Corellia attempted to take things in their own hands and attacked Corsac. Get in contact with our people on Coruscant. Find what in the hells those lunatics in the Senate and Gar think they're doing. Get that Admiral back on. Merikope ordered. Couple of seconds later, Felix's image was back on. Admiral, all Republic ships are to move at least two light seconds from Corellio ASAP. You will order all GAR personnel on the ground to stand down as well. If you do not, I will consider the presence of your forces as a clear and present danger to my people and act accordingly. I'm afraid I cannot do that, Ma'am Governor General. The contingency orders are absolute. They're to be executed at all cost and no matter the consequences. I implore you to stand down and let me do my duty. The clone looked sincere and unyielding. You're aware you're committing an act of war against one of the few allies the Republic has in this war? Merikope asked. I am, ma'am. My orders stand. Anyone interfering with their execution is to be considered enemy and eliminated. Shyla closed her eyes and sighed. This was utter madness. Yet, she had her duty to her people who were fighting and dying right now. Damn you, Merikope hissed. Give me channel to all our military forces. She waited for confirmation. This is Diktat Shyla Merikope. Execute contingency Winter Solace. I repeat Winter Solace. All non-Corellian ships in orbit are to be neutralized. Any Republic ship approaching a two light seconds exclusion zone from Corellia is to be considered hostile. She paused to take a breath. Republic forces stationed on Corellia attempted the unlawful arrest of all Jedi on the planet. When Corsac personnel took offense, they were engaged by our supposed allies. 
All attempts to peacefully resolve this crisis have been met with threats and demands to hand up people under the charge of treason. Yet the Republic commanders were unable to give any shred of proof to support such grievous charges. All they tell us is that they have their orders. Equals RK equals. After the Republic flagship went down with all hands, pure chaos reigned across the Corellian system. The carefully orchestrated defense fell apart as command and control lines shredded. In places Republic and Corellian ships continued fighting side by side against overwhelming odds. The task forces meant to reinforce them often didn't show and they died fighting valiantly until destruction. In other sectors of the system-wide battlefield, Corellian ships peeled off and abandoned the Republic Navy as they followed winter contingency and made best speed for their homeworld. At the same time, Republic battle groups peeled off and left their local counterparts to fend for themselves as they hurried for Corellia so they could execute Order 66. While madness grasped their enemies, the Confederacy Navy was briefly shocked and in inaction. For a time they suspected a trap and merely redressed their lines while dealing with the forces still engaging them. Yet, it didn't take long for Admiral Trench to make up his mind. He saw an opportunity and grasped it by throwing everything he had at the remaining two brothers, thus ignoring Corellia for the time being. His forces used the opportunity to decimate what was left of the enemy construction and infrastructure across the system which suddenly found itself abandoned. Equals RK equals. Jedi Temple. Corellia. The fight for the Jedi Temple lasted more than an hour. By then the Gar Battalion which was stationed nearby was all but gone, yet more and more clones were funneled into the fight from the four Republic ships above Coronet. All attempt to take them out from the ground failed courtesy to the Guardian systems and hovering just below the engagement range of the planetary defense cannons which were supposed to cover the capital. Those ships also intercepted any attempts from forces outside Coronet to reinforce the Jedi fighting to their lives, which meant only Corsac units covered by the capital's theater shield could offer any respite. Ultimately, those forces weren't enough. There weren't many Jedi left at the temple in the first place, most of them were spread all over the planet or the other worlds making up the Five Brothers. When the engagement began, the defenders were caught off guard by the clone units on Corellia turning on them. Corsac troopers and Jedi like fought like demons who crawled out of the Ninth Hell, yet they were slowly but surely overwhelmed. Waves of clones, gunship raining hell and even limited direct fire support from the ships over Coronet saw to that. We need to get out of here, Jabo snapped. We can't kid. Any transport trying to leave gets shot down by those ships. The same goes for our reinforcements. Unless the Navy deign to show up, we're crift. A Corsac lieutenant taking cover nearby shouted. There's no shield covering us. Enough firepower to take out those things will kill us too. Jabo shot back. I know. The officer snapped. Jabo looked around. They were pushed almost into the gardens at the back of the temple. Once the clones forced them in the open it was all over. The gunships would make a short work of them. There was less than a platoon left from the Corsac and a handful of Jedi left. That was all. There were at least few more survivors cut off deeper in the large building. The explosions and distant shots were proof enough, though those people weren't going to be much help. At least Eli was still in one piece, though after her mother died she was out of it. Here they come. The lieutenant shouted. Sure enough. A bunch of smoke grenades rolled in and the moment they obscured everything, Jabo could hear armored feet running towards them. So much for the short respite they got. Jabo ignited his lightsaber and prepared to meet the next onslaught. Blaster fire flew in all directions, then a deafening thunder struck the Jedi Temple like the fist of an angry god. The sound came as a physical wave that tried to rattle the teeth right out of his mouth. Moments later, it got very warm. Jabo didn't hear the next explosion, though he felt it as the whole building shook. The Corellian Navy finally came down to play and they were all crift. Equals Ashe equals. Flag bridge. Republic cruiser hunter. Corellia. What? That was all Admiral Yularen could say once his fleet exited hyperspace. He knew that the Jedi had attempted a coup on Coruscant and that the planet was in chaos while Gar elements were attempting to secure the damn place. He knew an Order 66 was given and all Jedi were supposed to be arrested. What he didn't know was why there were Corellian and Republic ships shooting at each other all across the system while apparently the Separatists were given a free reign to do what the Kriff they wanted as long as they didn't approach Corellia itself or any large concentration of Republic ships. As far as the sensors could tell, 
There were no Republic ships within two light second radius of Corellia and the bulk of those remaining were forming into assault formations aimed at the planet. What the griff? Yularen asked in disbelief. Get me whoever is in charge of this griff up on the line now. The Admiral let out an uncharacteristic snarl. It took almost a minute before the holographic image of a clone wearing a green uniform just like Yularen's appeared in the center of the flag bridge. Sir, Admiral Felix reporting. Explanation. Good one. Now. Yularen growled. It wasn't professional but at that moment he didn't really care. Just what the criff? Karelian forces attempted to prevent the execution of Order 66. We engaged them. We're currently preparing to assault Corellia so we could carry out our orders. The clone answered calmly. Run that by me again. Yularen somehow was able to gather his crumbling professionalism and spoke in a light, almost pleasant tone. It sounded like you attacked our allies so you could carry your orders. Which were to protect this system against the Confederacy. That's negative sir. Contingency Order 66 is in effect. It trumps all pre-existing orders. Felix still looked unperturbed. Rear Admiral, you're relieved of command. A fell seconds later, Vulf was speaking to all Republic forces in the systems. This is Admiral Yularen. Admiral Felix is relieved of command. I'm assuming direct command of all Republic forces in the system. You're to stop any and all offensive actions against our Karelian allies. We're here to fight the Separatist, not each other. Admiral Yularen, I'm compelled to ask you what are you intending to do about Order 66? Felix asked. That's no longer your concern, Admiral. Wolf glared at the clone. I'm afraid it is, sir. If you intend not to do your best to ensure Order 66 is executed, I'll be compelled to consider your orders as not lawful and continue doing my duty. Admiral Yularen, I've been listening to your conversation. Captain Wren, the hunter's CO interrupted. I'm afraid, Admiral Felix is correct, sir. I believe you're unaware of the gravity of the situation. The clone continued. Wolf redirected his glare to the image of his flag captain. What is the meaning of this, Wren? The contingency orders are absolute, sir. They must be obeyed and executed no matter what. If you have no intention of doing your best to follow Order 66, I'll have no option but to remove you from command. I'm sorry sir. We're good soldiers and we have our orders. Yularen looked incredibly at Wren. He opened his mouth to relieve him too, then paused and looked around. Every single clone in the flag bridge looked at him. You all agree, don't you? Wolf concluded incredulously. That is correct sir. You expect me to order an attack on Corellia to capture the Jedi there instead of engaging the Separatists rampaging throughout the system. Yularen couldn't believe it. That's correct sir. Unless you could persuade the Corellians to stand down. That outcome would be preferable. Order 66 takes absolute priority. Felix answered. And if I can't persuade them? Wolf asked. Then you either lead us in battle against them or we'll have to remove you from command, sir. Wren spoke with conviction that was scary. Are all clones convinced of that course of action? Yularen asked. The looks on the faces of the people around him was an answer enough. Who could countermand Order 66 so we could deal with the real enemy? Only the Supreme Commander of the Gar, sir. Get me line to Karaskand now and open a channel to Corellia. Let's not kill any more people than we have to. Thank you, sir. Felix sounded relieved. I stand relieved. Yularen nodded glumly. The utter conviction and readiness the clones showed to turn on an ally because of a contingency order made his blood chill. What other such orders were there?